focusing on all of those things and making sure you're doing those to the best of your ability, I can't really tangibly pinpoint what the impact will be. But it, like that case in point is it's like it will have an impact. You just don't know what it will be yet. And if you can control the things that you can control, then it's like all the other variables. You're as prepared as you can possibly be for that, I guess I'd say. Welcome to Revenue Insights. Every week, we'll be joined by revenue leaders from some of the most successful and highest growing companies. Together, we explore how they built their revenue teams, the journeys that they've been on, and the lessons they have learned along the way. Revenue Insights is brought to you by Ebster. We're a revenue intelligence platform designed to help revenue teams to build more pipeline, close more deals, and retain more customers. Hello there, you're listening to Revenue Insights. Today, I'm picking the brains of Christian de Marais. He's the Director of Revenue Operations and Strategy over at Wix. He's been spearheading strategic and revenue generating initiatives across all teams over the past few years. So Christian, I'm interested to learn a little bit more about what you've been up to. Welcome. Yeah, well, thanks for having me. Um, what have I been up to? That's a very good question. So we, uh, right now, we kind of, Wix obviously has this huge uh, user base of, I think it's around 300 million or something along those lines. So what's cool at Wix is we're able to gather a lot of data on our users once they log into the platform. So within that, it offers us a lot of different, almost too many sometimes, um, ways to target our users to A, like get them to adopt certain products that we've developed. We have a whole suite of hundreds of products. And in addition, like generate revenue. So there's multiple ways to generate revenue at Wix, one of which is just like purchasing different premium plans and like getting people to subscribe every year. And, and you know, we have a business premium. We, ha we have all these different kinds of premiums. So that's one way to generate revenue. But a big way to generate revenue for us also is our payments tool. So getting people like hooked on that. So when they're processing above a certain level, we'll take a certain percent. And it's just like this, it gets the stickiness of the user in terms of like their usage and getting them to stay with Wix for as long as possible. Um, it just increases that. So that's always kind of our goal, but it manifests itself in a lot of different ways. So we'll have... We have like account management teams who work with partners specifically who build websites for other users. And then we also have like customer success managers who manage individual users. Like let's say I run a business and I built my site myself sort of on Wix or I hired a, a, a developer to do like very little work independently and then I run it basically. We also have like an account management for those users where it's like they don't necessarily have always a, a developer background, but we're able to help them like maximize their site, like lower abandoned carts and, and all of these things um, to help grow their business, run Facebook ad campaigns, right? Which is like another thing that we we do that sees like a very specific, okay, I put in this much money and this is my return on ad spend. So we have uh, multiple iterations of all of these teams. We've had like pure sales teams that like, yeah, they sell Facebook ad campaigns. They sell branded app, um, kind of like where we develop an app for a specific company. Um, Ascend, which is sort of like our version of a CRM. But then we also have like, we've, we've worked with teams in the past that, that are really trying to get brand new users to Wix to like, purchase certain premiums, get them ready in their relevant vertical. So if they're like a bookings and fitness user, or if there's like a, a new store, um, we really want to help them set up and then and then get them to use Wix payments because A, it's it's much easier for them and there's it's a great product. There's a lot of benefits to using Wix payments. But for us, it also just helps us um, like really maximize the potential of their site and their business and help us grow. I think that was one of the main things that was really cool um, about working at Wix during COVID is that like we really 
not to get sentimental about it, but we really helped a lot of these brick and mortar businesses that needed to survive in a certain way that didn't necessarily have a huge online presence. We helped them migrate their business to the web, basically, and be able to help maximize, um, even sometimes grow their business during a time where most businesses were really struggling. So it was really kind of, uh, not, not to be like too cliche about it, but it was like you tangibly felt the impact of, of what you're working on and what you're doing. And sometimes a lot of that can get lost in the sauce when you're just, you know, building Salesforce automations or KPIs and reporting and tracking and, and projection, whatever it might be. Um, but that was something that that's really rewarding and is always kind of rewarding. And what I've really loved about Wix is like, it's all about the users at the end of the day and, and, and getting them to be successful. Um, and that's why we, we have feature requests that like a lot of our, our account managers are, are gathering so that we can put those into the product roadmap so that we can help make everything better all the time and improve. And I think, um, yeah, so, so that's, in a nutshell, what I'm working on. We also have a new point of sale product, which is very exciting that, uh, you know, integrates directly into people's Wix sites. And it's a seamless sort of, um, ecosystem for stores and events users and all of these, these different things. So yeah, it's, it's nice. And we sort of talked about this before, um, where Wix is great in that. It is a it is a big company. It has the sort of a lot of resources that big companies can provide, but it's also able to harness this sort of startup environment where it's it's relatively lean. It's very like in terms of starting new initiatives. Um, there's always there's always room for like the best idea can win out, which I really like, and um, they're not afraid to try new and exciting things, which I think is a testament to why they're successful ultimately at the end of the day. So, yeah. I, I appreciate uh, all of the context and and there's probably two bits that I want to take away from that. One is, uh, what I actually really like is is that, I um, can't think of a better, a better word for it, but that the, the more emotional side to it, where a lot of the times in revenue operations, it's, it's data and you're looking at numbers and charts and graphs. and But it's ultimately, you know, what we're here to do is to create a better experience and to generate more, more, more revenue for the business and actually getting the satisfaction of, you know, the user actually getting value from the end of it. So I, I just wanted to reiterate, um, and that point. And then the bit that I, the thread that I really want to follow is actually the point that you mentioned at the end, which, you know, is a fairly big business at this stage. Um, uh, but still has that startup style feel to it. So for kind of the listeners at home, uh, I'd love for you to, um, Perhaps add a bit more color around the revenue operations team. So, you know, how is, is it just you? I think there's uh, quite a number of you, right? And, and then a bit more information on how you work with like the different, different teams within Wix. Yeah. So we, we have a pretty, uh, I wouldn't say gigantic revenue operations team, but, but it is like there are probably about 10 to 12 of us. I think. Um, and it contains like everyone sort of like owns certain teams. So like there is um, with our partnerships that we have with different like web development agencies, one person sort of owns all of that with um, we we sort of work with large scale uh, businesses who buy the premiums that that we we sort of that I mentioned before, they buy those in bulk and they they sort of like resell those to their end users as well. We have somebody who owns all of that. Like I sort of own a bit more of the, the us working with individual users, like I kind of mentioned, who aren't necessarily being supported by a partner or a, a developer constantly. Um, within that realm, I sort of I sort of work. On all of those things, we have uh, a couple of other products that that we we sell. That like there, there's again a person who owns that, um, and we we have like some enablement. I think systems enablement is really kind of 
kind of huge in that it, at, at certain companies like sales enablement will um, encompass all of that. It will encompass like, okay, just coaching how to be on a phone, how to, you know, how to, how to keep the conversation going, you know, deal with any objections, things like that. But with us, we actually have someone specifically oriented to like the systems part of that, where it's like, okay, CRM, any of your activity logging, any of your like automations that maybe aren't working, what do you need to do? How do you use Salesforce to optimize your day and really like waste as little time as possible so that we can ultimately serve our end user as best we can Um which is always the goal. Like, like we, we don't want our reps to have to, um, or even our directors or, or managers, anyone to, to have to be doing admin work um, and wasting their time with that. So, so that's kind of like the through line, obviously. But yeah, so it's, it's kind of all over the place. And, and I will say that like, I've kind of dabbled in, in ev- we, we've all kind of know everything about everything ultimately at the end of the day. But um it does help to have that, like, this is your area of expertise and, and there's oversight, obviously, but um, I think that that's really helpful and it allows you to, like, instead of doing a lot of things mediocre, to, like, do really focus and own something, like, top to bottom, it provides a lot of great uh, opportunities for, for growth and, and just, like, optimization in general. Yeah, absolutely. And, and on that last point, it, um, it reminded me of uh, a guest that I had on a couple of weeks back, Lorena Morales, who was talking about with her team, uh, particularly with you know the, the, an economic downturn on the horizon. She was encouraging her team to actually um, you know expand their skill set. You know, don't just focus on the one area that you're specialized in. You know, be be open minded. You know, learn different areas. You know, you don't have to be. Um, you don't have to be a, an expert in all things, but actually having that wider awareness of what's happening in the business, particularly in revenue operations, where your role typically is obviously spreading across different different teams and different areas, makes makes a huge amount of sense. And so, oh, yeah. in in your specific area with those individual users, what would you say has been probably the biggest challenge that you faced over the past twelve months that you've been trying? And either succeeding or still trying to overcome. Yeah, so I think what I sort of we 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 mentioned this a little bit before we we started um, in our conversation, but want to just bubble up again is is like because there are so many different opportunities to help our users maximize their business. Um, it also means we have different teams for like all of these sometimes like these different initiatives or like they all have different roles, but it's like ultimately the same user at the end of the day. So our goal is to get everyone to be a top user, right? Where they're like top 300 sites at Wix in terms of processing, in terms of like site visits in terms of time on all of these different things. Like we want to grow everyone's business to be as successful as possible. And to do that, there's so many different checks and balances along the way and so many different teams that can help that person. It's not like we're going to account manage them um, immediately and have like weekly meetings with them to check in on site performance or things like that when they're a brand new user and just setting up their site. But it's like, so in terms of a revenue operations standpoint, like we want to help guide that user from like the very top of the funnel all the way to the bottom of like when they're a brand new user, we want to help them get online as quickly as possible, get ready as quickly as start processing as quickly as possible, increase visits to their site by maybe running Facebook ad campaigns. But even within that, in terms of uh, like, that seems like a very specific funnel, but we have like different teams for each part of that. Like we have a team that helps brand new users. And then we have another team that would like in the past would help sort of like grow and streamline them, which is like running Facebook ad campaigns, maybe setting up a send or a CRM to, to really kind of help cultivate your customer base and and keep 
that growing in a different way. And then like, if we can grow them to a certain point, then we'll start to like manage them to a degree of like offering them a, a, a somebody who can always be a resource for them to help add specific products, um, maximize what they already have, help with site edits, any bugs, things like that, that come up along their journey. So in, let's say, Salesforce, you already have, even within the, the customer journey of the first year, you already have like three or four different teams that might want to be reaching out with them, meeting with them. And every team has their own outreach funnel and their own KPIs, but it's like the same user. So I developed this thing um, that that we we sort of said when they become, because everyone's a customer at the end of the day already, which is that's the difficult part. So it's like when, like looking at a CRM and looking at like leads and accounts, when does something become an account? Like, is it always an account? Because it's already a customer even before uh, before you really like get in touch with them. So we kind of had been working leads and every time you hand it off to a new team until until you like make it a managed account, it'll just stay as a lead, but then you like reset it back to being new. And then you're like, okay, did we reach out to this person? Did we connect with this person? Did we have a meeting with this person? Did we close with this person? Whatever. Um, so I developed this thing in Salesforce that's like, it's basically a, it's like an object that updates dynamically. So it gives you like a current snapshot of what's happening on the lead. And then every time you like reassign it to a new team, that object will stop updating dynamically and will just keep like a history record of when this team owned this lead, they moved it to like a uh, discovery held stage or they were able to have a meeting and then, it, you know, they weren't able to ultimately sell the business premium because of X, Y, Z. But that's all trapped in there. And it'll say like, this is how many calls they made. This is how many emails they made. This is how many replies they got all within this thing. So that when we reassign it, the lead, and we, we set it all the way back to new again, um, then that there will be a new snapshot that will start to actively dynamically update. And you'll be able to see because sometimes, and this is this is the difficult part, is like sometimes you'll need to send uh, like variable comp or some sort of goal KPI analysis by the end of a month, but that lead will already have needed to be reached out by another team to help them in the next part of the process of their journey. So it's like you can't really run a report because that team doesn't even own like the user anymore and, and it's being managed by somebody else, but you need to have it within such a short period of time. So that's where like that part of it of having multiple different funnels for multiple different teams on the same user, sometimes simultaneously, has been really difficult. But I think we came up with a rather elegant solution and it was a lot of work, but that's been really difficult. Like it's exciting, obviously, that there are so many opportunities and we do have so many tangible ways to help our users and partners grow. But from like a, a tracking KPI automation standpoint, it makes it super difficult. So you just, and, and I think the thing about Wix is because everything's happening so quickly, you're kind of, it's not like you can plan it out for three months in advance and build it with your dev and like painstakingly set it up and then launch it. It's like you kind of, the very Wix way to put it is like you're building the plane as you're flying it, yeah. sort of. And so that's that's been, I'd say, the the biggest challenge. Yeah, um, but I think we did okay with it. Yeah, it's um, it it, it rings through on many levels actually. There were, there were two bits that kind of came to my my mind as you were talking about it. On the one side, it reminded me, you know, the structure of how things work reminded me a lot of. Um, I was listening to another podcast um, regarding Duolingo, so the 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 um, uh, the app where you can learn languages, and uh, they very much run in a very similar way of having different teams looking at different areas of the product to, to help to improve it. Now, granted, your guys' model is a little bit different to that, but what was so interesting about that is you're looking at different areas. But obviously, what stood out to me is you have this unique challenge where you have different people ultimately having a relationship with that user or with that account coming into it at different times. And it's 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 the having visibility of that, which is so difficult. 
Um, it, it, it stands out for me a lot because it's something that like in house we've been helping customers as, as well on a, on a slightly different scale where we will, we will, we will work with businesses that have, um, accounts where at any one time that, that user might be having 20 to 30 conversations with, with our customer. And so, you know, it's, it's on a more granular level of terms, you know, it's, you know, when you move a deal, perhaps they go from being a prospect into being a customer. When they get to that stage, it's okay. What, what conversations have been had? What's actually been happening? What's the state of play? And you end up wasting so much time trying to catch up with things and meetings go into the calendar. And it's like, Oh my God, what a nightmare. So actually I, I completely, um, am on board with the, the pain that, that, you guys were having and I'm also on board with the solution for it as well because it makes such a huge difference. Oh, a hundred percent. And it's like, I should send you, I built like a, a flow of like, there's lead distribution, but then redistribution. And like, there's so many different triggers and it can go to so many different teams that it's like, it's literally endless with the amount of triggers we had and teams it could go to. And when do we hold something versus let it go? Um, and yeah, it's, but that's what I love about it. Of like, there's, there's always such insane, uh, kind of needs that you need to figure out a solution for. And then being able to backtrack from there, I, I just find it fascinating and always, always exciting, especially once you solve it. Yeah, exactly. Um, right. And I think getting there, it, it's such a, it's such a common trait <laughs> I find with, uh, with revenue operations people is, uh, it's a real love for solving problems. Um, and so, so let me flip this to something that you talked about earlier, you know, the satisfaction that you felt from during like a COVID time of helping businesses when they needed to pivot. Um, COVID was the time when it literally almost the, the light, uh, the, 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 the switch flicked at that point. And we're obviously entering slash in an interesting period now of like economic downturn. And I'm, I'm curious to know from, from your perspective and, and, and in your role, is that having an impact on how you're planning things going into 2023? Are there any initiatives that you're running to be able to help customers who are inevitably going to be preparing for that? Yeah, I think like, I mean, it's, it's tough because it's like, how do you even prepare for something like that? I think, um, we have always kind of been working in like uh, seasonality too with a lot of our customers or things like that, where it's like there are gaps and there are um, times in which you're maybe not going to be making money or, or you need to figure out ways in which to, kind of what I talked about before, help cultivate your existing customers, but find new customers as well. So like, I think relying on some of those tools that I talked about of like really helping people with Ascend, which is our CRM and, and running marketing campaigns and like rewards programs, coupons, discounts, all of this stuff, like, uh, you know, membership uh, parts of your existing customer base, base, but like growing it, like that's a huge part of it. And then, then kind of, like I said, to like targeted Facebook ad campaigns and even SEO strategy is such a huge thing that um, a lot of our success managers are able to provide and, and come up with a specific strategy of like, okay, how can I maximize when somebody's going onto Google and searching? I want to be in in every search that could possibly come up and the tags that we put in and everything that we're doing strategy-wise, I want to be the first thing that comes up because it's like, that's the difference ultimately at the end of the day between, you know, you making money or not. And even just like, one customer, you know, the, the extrapolation from your impact. And that's kind of like what we try and try and say is like every customer matters and every customer counts at the end of the day. And for our end users too, of like, you don't know what the impact of, of even just a, the simplest thing of like being number two on Google versus being number one, what that can mean. And if you can hook somebody and even just get them to your site, which we spend so much time like just getting them to the site is such a huge thing too. So it's it's a bit about focusing on all those other intangibles as well, um, which is like part of it. But then, yeah, at the end of the day, you're kind of, uh, when it comes to like commerce and, and businesses and all these different things, like 
we, uh, you are reactive to whatever's happening in the world. Sometimes when something terrible is happening in the world, like a pandemic, we can provide a really great, like, guiding light for a lot of people in a, in a way. But then there are other intangible things that you just can't, you just can't plan for. So you, you just focus on the things you can control um, and really do that to the best of your ability. And, and I think that's, you, you asked me uh, sort of before this too, like what was one sort of book that I, I would recommend or that I really like. And, and this actually ties in really well with this book. Um, I don't know, maybe it's a cliche answer and people have already brought it up, but the book is called The Power of Habit. Um, I don't know if you've ever read it. It's really great. There's one example specifically that comes to mind in that. It just sort of goes through um, different instances in which habit for better or worse, like led to, well, it, it, it goes through the science of habits just in general. But the, 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 the thing that I'm thinking about is there's this example of, I think the company's called Alcoa. Um, they had some sort of accident um, and they brought in a new CEO because the, the market capitalization was like in the tank and, and he decided to focus Instead of, of being like, let's change everything, grow the company, make it profitable, whatever. He decided to basically focus on a keystone habit or like one element to everything. And by focusing on that one element, which was safety protocols, making Alcoa like the safest possible company that it could be. By doing that and setting up standards and practices around safety and making sure everyone followed protocol, it just like had this, this, this impact of it automatically made people like be much more communicative, much more um, responsive to like following protocol, uh, being collaborative, being in communication constantly with their coworkers and different departments and all these different things. So just by focusing on one little keystone, it actually permeated into the entire business in a way that made the market capitalization grow and made it more profitable and, and helped the, the, the company sort of, of uh, really become successful in the way that it, it wanted to. And that's what I found fascinating. It sort of ties back into my point of, of when you know there's like an impending downturn or recession or whatever. It's like, yeah, focusing on all of those things and making sure you're doing those to the best of your ability. We don't, I mean, I can't really tangibly pinpoint what the impact will be, but it, it, like that case in point is it's like, it will have an impact. You just don't know what it will be yet. And if you can control the things that you can control, then it's like all the other variables. Um, you're as prepared as you can possibly be for that, I guess I'd say. Yeah, it's really uh, that, that the the line that I was writing down from what you've just shared was like focusing on what you control, right? Um, because uh, I think it's a really valuable point with not just revenue operations in mind and uh, excellent book recommendation. You've stolen the last question off off my tongue before we even get there, but uh, but I love but I love it and um, it, it's a great book as well. And, and would recommend it to to listeners. But it's it's a great point on actually focusing on only the things um, that you actually can have an influence over because there's so many different variables that it can become very easy to get. Um, to to lose focus on and to get distracted by and actually it's the amazing the impact that it can have by focusing on the things that actually you can impact so um I've just been speaking to a, another guest in in Moise uh, who was talking about from a sales process kind of perspective actually focusing on um you know what what are actually your reps doing you know in that example it's reps who are you know uh have a preference for sending emails rather than jumping on the phone, right? In a in a revenue operations perspective, it's looking at the numbers and going, okay, how much of this can I actually have an influence over, and how much of it is very much out of my control? Um, and uh, and it's a really interesting point that 
I, I kind of want to tail this and move it in the direction of something that we were talking about pre-show. Um, and, and one of the questions I wanted to ask you was, uh, how do you work with the teams that, that you're working with? Because often I find um, one of the challenges with, within revenue operations is you've got all of this data and you were talking about the the flow chart. I'd actually love to see it because I think it would blow my mind, like even you just you describing it. And so often it's it's the challenge of being able to communicate through the what is, I feel like an immense level of understanding down to the people that are ultimately on the front line and putting it into a, a language that ultimately they're going to be able to understand because as much as you or I might be able to understand, understand that, massive flow chart or the, the the chart or the graph, actually translating it through to them is is a real challenge. So how do you do it? Yeah, so I'll say too that like I, and I think not like the best RevOps people have some sort of background in sales, but I I did work very briefly in my career as like an SDR AE. So I have kind of come from that side to the operation side, which is always helpful. And I think even if you don't have that experience, a great way to do that, which is something that we constantly do, is like just shadowing reps. Because I think reps will bring feedback to their managers or like we have a service desk also where they bubble up like bugs or issues that they're having. And sometimes it's just specific like, oh, I can't log in to my, you know, sales loft or whatever tool we're using at the time. So like a lot of it just gets filtered because it's going to a manager, it's going to a director, it's going to whoever, and then it finds our way to us. And we're doing like large scale projects sometimes or sometimes small scale reports. So things can slip through the cracks. So that's where, you know, we we do work with the, the TLs and managers, but I do think something that's invaluable First of all, is is shadowing is like uh, seeing what reps are doing on a day to day basis, and 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 even asking their TLs like, okay, what is your prototypical rep? Like, what are they the most successful version of somebody on your team? What should they be doing? And every TL will probably give you a different answer. Of like, some will want something very structured, and like they come in every morning and they log into you know, Salesforce, HubSpot, whatever. And they, this pops up on their homepage. And it's like, these are the the list of things that they need to do tasks. And they need to like reach out to these people they haven't talked to in a while. And these are follow-ups. These are like admin things they need to do. Really lay it out for them. And others are like, might be, oh, I want people to find their own creative solutions and they can do whatever they want. And we kind of have to work within both of those realms because we have, or all... That's only two examples. There's probably 500. But, um, and and I think the benefit that we have also is we have a systems enablement person, but we also work with the sales enablement people and like the learning and development teams very closely to know like, okay, we might make some, build a tool for them or create an automation in Salesforce, but like if they don't A, know it exists or B, really know how to maximize it, then um, A, we're not helping them be as efficient as possible. But B, then it's like, it's it's all for naught at the end of the day. Like we're pouring our time and energy and resources into something that like, is it really landing or is it really aligning with what they need at the end of the day? Um, and so that's a huge part of it. I think enablement, if you have that to really lean on them, just from an information standpoint of like, where are the gaps and how can we address it? And is it a communication thing or is it a, like we need to build more tools and, and help uh, cultivate an environment that's a little bit easier to use? Because I know <laughs> CRMs in general can be a little clunky and it's, it's like trying to shove a, a round peg into a square hole at times. Um, and so, yeah, really... Really, being in communication, I, I find with with reps is is very helpful to just kind of um, yeah know on the front lines a bit of of how what your what your perceived impact is is actually 
uh, being used and being received. Um, because it's like well, we talk about our, our customers at the end of the day, but RevOps customers are the, the teams themselves. And like our end users uh, from RevOps standpoint are the reps at the end of the day and are the managers and, and the TLs and the directors and all these people. So we owe it to our stakeholders, our customers to like really understand them. And, and it's the same, the same thing. If we don't like, if, if a salesperson doesn't get on the call with, you know, their pers- prospect or whoever they're trying to uh, manage or sell to or whatever help, um, they're not going to have any information. And the same goes for us. Like if we don't talk to our end users, our, our stakeholders, our customers, especially the reps, I find, um, yeah, you're, you're only going to have, like I said, your perceived impact and, and versus your actual impact at the end of the day. So, yeah. You uh, you made a re- really interesting point, and I'm seeing more of a trend of you know operations very much working hand in hand with and alongside enablement teams. And one of the things that I that I wanted to ask you, kind of coming into this chat, was um, I, I know looking at your or certainly digging into your LinkedIn, you know, one of your roles has been very much uh, bringing in new technology. And uh, I'm, I'm curious, you know, say for example, you're perhaps bringing in a new piece of tech now. Do you, are you working alongside your enablement teams to, you know, ensure they're getting the maximum value out of it? Because certainly coming from a software sales background, I know for us, you know, you'll be selling into like one, two, three people, but we inevitably have, you know, 20 plus users of it. And it's all well and good getting a, you know, a new toolbox, but it's like, okay, what, what on earth do I do is just wrench, right? How do I actually get value out of it? So it's yeah. for you guys, what's it like? So I think... I mean, usually now when you're onboarding a new item into your tech stack, it's like that company will hold a training and will hold their version of like a Q and A Q&A session, a walkthrough of the product, whatever. Which is always going to be helpful, but yeah, it's it's like the looking at the usage specifically. So we always, and this is learning from past experience. Even if it's like a tool that we're home, like it's homegrown and we're building it in Salesforce, on before it's even launched, like how are ways that we can build things to track specifically, like are people using it and is it successful? I think is huge. So I know it's we're kind of intangibly talking about a hypothetical, but but. I I think that's such a huge part of it, and and uh, sometimes depending on the tool, it will have that inherently built in. But um, I I think like not to relate it back to what I just said, but like the perceived impact of something versus the actual impact, or the perceived usage of it versus the actual usage. Um, it it is helpful to talk to like reps and get feedback, but having like hard data criteria of like, let's say it's a lead sourcing tool, really knowing that you can track specifically, like let's say it's, uh, I don't really know what it would be, but like it involves you going on LinkedIn and sourcing it yourself, knowing like this is how many closes this month came from this specific tool, using this specific tool or whatever. Or knowing that like, our ability to connect with this user, like it came from this phone number that we were able to get from this tool. So that justifies the existence of this tool and it means that people are using this tool. Um, Like that's just an example, but I think that's so huge is like going into even implementing something new is it's like, how can we, because there's there's an approval process at Wix as I'm sure exists at any company to get funds for new tools. And it's like, you really have to justify the money to have a new contract with them or even grow a contract. So we, you know, there's, there's marketing automation a lot of the times that like sends out emails. So anytime you can relate specific goals and KPIs to those campaigns or to those emails being sent, that's huge because then it justifies the existence of that tool. It justifies even growing headcount for usage of that tool or growing the contract or whatever, going into implementing something into a tech stack. I think that's so huge 
and will ultimately allow you or afford you the ability to add more stuff. Because if you're always thinking that way, then you're always able to know if something is justified or not. Hopefully, every time you do implement something new, it proves to be successful and you are able to like, the KPIs that you're tracking are good because sometimes they won't be. And that's just uh, sometimes par for the course. But yeah, that that's always, especially learning from experience, I would say um, is paramount in what we really focus on or what I try to focus on. Yeah, I, I- Absolutely. Uh, Christian, it's probably about time for us now. It's been absolutely fantastic to have you on and to dig in a little more. Um, I, I would love to see that flow chart if you could, uh, <laughs> I'll send it and, yeah. uh, it's and I'll, I'll describe it to you in, uh, in, uh, in the post that goes out with this. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and also you mentioned, um, uh, power of habit, I believe by Charles Duhigg. Um, yeah, that proves yeah, yeah. that I've re- uh, read it. Um, That's right. We'll, we'll, we'll include a link to that in the uh, in the show notes as well. Uh, and so, just before we we wrap up, um, for anyone uh, listening at home that wants to follow you, learn a little bit more about what you're doing, um, where can they find you? Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn. I'm also on Twitter and Instagram. We we talked about this briefly. I I also have an MFA in acting, so I'm an actor too. You can find me on IMDb. Um, just out here trying to trying to make a living, you know. So uh, we all follow different paths sometimes <laughs> simultaneously, and 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 that's kind of where I'm at right now. But yeah, just very. Very grateful to be working at Wix and have the team that I have and that you also uh, invited me onto this podcast for this conversation. It was really good. So thank you. No problem that. at all. It's, it's been an absolute pleasure. Well, thank you again, Christian, and uh, to everyone that has listened to this one back at home. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to Revenue Insights. If you want to learn more, subscribe to our newsletter and we'll deliver every episode straight to your inbox. If you have any questions, feel free to connect with us on LinkedIn. Our links will be in the episode notes. See you next week.